application into our credit. So, so now, uh, now over to you, Dr. Neelam. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have some slides, so I'll try if I'm able to share these. Please let me know if you can see these. It's visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This is an honor to be speaking here uh, with such eminent panel. And um, um, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time. Um, uh, Rubel had told me that I have 15 minutes, so I'll try to stick to that time limit. Uh, and it's also early morning for me, so it's like the start of the day for me. So um, I have, when he told me about the topic, media in society, Actually, this is also a class that I teach at Idaho State University, so it's right up my alley there. Um, we have a long history here to cover, and we can talk our entire lifetime about how is it media affecting society. You know, it's, it's affecting every aspect of our society. But then I tried to stick this up to uh, some of my latest research in around journalism and digital media, especially pertaining to India. So I grew up in India, I studied in India, I worked in India, and then I moved to the US to do my PhD. So I'm not an outsider. I understand how the Indian media works, but I'm not very informed as well because I moved away. So you can correct me um, if I make a mistake here, but I'm gonna base my talk here on the research that I've conducted and, and especially around the need for media literacy campaigns for misinformation that's going on, the hate campaigns that are going on. So I have four studies that I will share with you briefly, the key findings, and then I will take any questions that you have or any comments that you, you have. So, uh, so Dr. Rubel has introduced me. Um, I'm uh, in my first year of assistant professor. I'm a tenure track assistant professor, and I'll be going up for tenure, hopefully later this year. And I also recruit and manage the MA program at the university. So, um, uh, so we don't have a PhD currently, but we have a master's program and I handle that program as well as a part of my job profile. Um, the focus of my PhD has been persuasion, narrative persuasion at the individual level. Uh, and I graduated from the Colorado State University in, in the US. Um, I worked for seven years as a journalist in India, Chandigarh, and that's how I, I know Jatin Gandhi. He was a big name in Chandigarh, and I was a small time reporter there. I didn't expect him to rem remember me, so thank you very much. But I was a principal correspondent with the Indian Express. Vipin Pabbi was my boss. And then I also worked at uh, the Times of India and Tribune, um, both um, in Chandigarh. And my areas of research have been psychology, journalism, persuasion, theory, and research methods. So um, I really began to dig my heels into Indian media, the contemporary media. And I'm not, I'm not gonna go into a lot of history of Indian media or history of media in general, but I'm gonna focus on the contemporary mediated society that we have in, the, in, in India currently and what are the challenges and opportunities that the country is facing. Um, I was, um, I happened to be uh, for three months in India in 2019, when I spent three months here in summer. And that was also a time when Narendra Modi was selected, elected for the second time. And I was intrigued by how this whole reporting, how the media was handling the situation. And what is this relationship of journalists with the political elite, the political class, and importantly, how are journalists being perceived in India? Because I think that's a big issue there, the credibility of mainstream press, the role of mainstream media. Um, I know Rubel briefly touched on that. Um, is media a part of the elite political class? Um, is it being viewed separate? Is it being viewed as corrupt? Or is it also, the biggest challenge here is, it is, is it being viewed as irrelevant? And that's a big question that we have to ask, especially when we have social media, especially when we have a political class, and, and that's not peculiar to India, but especially when we have a peculiar class that wants to bypass the mainstream media, that wants to discredit the mainstream media, that doesn't want to engage with the new mainstream media in a neutral way, but wants to engage with the mainstream media that's friendly to it. I don't want to go into any political ideologies here, but I'm going to strictly be within the research that I conducted. So 
I, I met with journalists across spectrum, both in legacy and new media in Delhi and in regional centers, um, especially journalists who had 10 to 15 years of minimum experience of political journalism in India, and they could compare different elections. This paper will be out soon. It's an inter inter uh, interview-based study post-2019 results. So I wanted to wait for the results to come out before I reach out to these journalists. And my questions were really very simple as any informed citizen would ask. I mean, who controls the agenda? We, we can go into agenda setting. Um, what's the role of the mainstream press? Are we still the gatekeepers? Are we relevant? Now, what I sense from that finding, and I have a paper there, is that there's a struggle going on between different entities of controlling the agenda. Everybody wants to control the agenda. And this is a struggle that we are witnessing. People want to control the agenda because they have social media as a tool. Political, political class wants to control the agenda using social media. And journalists want to retain their role as gatekeepers in the society. We witnessed a lot of hate campaign, uh, online attacks, uh, political parties pumping a lot of money, and journalists, journalists witnessing these WhatsApp messages, especially in rural Hindi heartland of the country during the election campaign, which went unchecked, but which had, which, which were circulated with the purpose to not only gain votes, but to divide the society. So we have a big issue going on. And if you talk to journalists who were field reporting during those days, they are full of stories. Uh, how messages, fake messages were targeted to sort two different population groups with a clear agenda. And a lot of money went into that thing. So the attempt here has been to kind of make the mainstream media, especially the media that is asking questions, irrelevant, so that the, the, the political class's agenda goes unfiltered. And this is happening across political spectrum. So we, we cannot blame one political party here. Everyone has budgets and teams and people working for these. So journalists kind of concluded in my study is that So the agenda, there is an attempt to use social media to set the headlines, to create issues, to keep journalists being engaged in that social media narrative and not let journalists think beyond that. So there's this catching game that's going on. And journalists feel that there's a need to break that. We cannot simply keep on reporting about people's tweets. If we keep doing that, then we are not relevant. But if we break that narrative, then we continue to remain relevant. Journalists feel that there are pressures on them uh, to keep following the social media narrative set by people. Um, they feel there are credibility issues, and they feel that misinformation and hate campaigns are on a rise in India, and there, ha there is an immediate need to do something about it. Uh, we have people in this panel here who are engaged with uh, misinformation, for example, or media literacy campaigns, for example, and I think there is this big need here. In the US, we have kind of recognized this and there is a sustained research around these things, especially during Trump era and post that. But in India, I think there is a need for more meaningful engagement, especially telling people that whatever they are reading on WhatsApp is not correct. So we have this issue going on, how you're gonna tackle it and how the election campaign 2024 is gonna look. I think there is a lot of research opportunity here, but it, what, what, how things are shaping right now don't look very promising. So things to learn here, but then we move on to another, another aspect of media, and that is how the political class is using it. So when we say media in society, we have journalists, who have traditionally been the content creator and distributors. By journalists, I mean press, right? Your legacy press. But then we also have now a political class who wants to do what it wants to do, right? So they don't want to engage with the um, um, your um, mainstream media, especially the media that is critical and questions them. So they have a tool in their hands. Uh, it isn't an India-specific phenomenon that's going on. We have witnessed it 
everywhere in Latin America, in Europe, in the US, uh, the rise of populism, the rise of populist leaders who use emotive messages, who don't engage with the mainstream press and who want to directly connect with people so that they can simply transmit their messages unfiltered to the people. And this is where my second research is. So this paper was presented at ICN. It's currently uh, being reviewed for publication. Uh, how did Narendra Modi use Twitter? Uh, Twitter I use as an example because Twitter data is easy to retrieve in 2014 and 2019. And this becomes especially interesting when uh, in 2014, he was positioning himself as an outsider. And in 2019, he was running for uh, a re-election, right? He was part of the political system in 19, 2019 compared to 2014. Um, and there are a lot of findings in the study and there are a lot of data in the study, but I'm gonna highlight a few things that immediately concern the mainstream media. Um, the engagement with the mainstream media was minimal in 2014. It was kind of ignored. You don't exist, you know. Um, I, I know what I'm doing and I'll connect with my people. You are a non-entity. But in 19, 2019, we see that this engagement is 10 times more than what it was in 2014. As journalists and as people who have been associated with journalism in one form or the other as educators or practitioners, it is our responsibility to understand and probably question what changed in those five years. Now, there are different opinions and I'm not gonna offer any opinion here because this is a fact that disengagement increased. But some of the opinions are, has the press become more establishment friendly than what it was in 14? Now, if I am running for election, I'm not gonna engage with a news article that's critical. I'm not gonna share that news article. I'm gonna share an article that is promoting my cause. So if I'm promoting, if I'm sharing more of me in three media's articles in 1919 compared to 14, it means that I have more favorable articles to share. My interviews in the mainstream media, how did that thing change? Why did that thing change? I think there are some serious ramifications here for the Indian media, some, some checking in the mirror. There are two things that could be going on, and I'm not going to comment on that. One thing, it could be that some voices are being suppressed. And the other thing could be that some people have completely turned around and changed their perspective on things. So there are two possibilities here, but then, of course, things have changed. Uh, we also find that uh, the political class, and, and this is a case study about Modi, but we can do the case study with pr pr pretty much any political leader here, is that this emotional connection with the voter, that I want to connect directly with you. And I'm going to use the media that I have under my control to do that. Again, the big question mark here is, is the mainstream press still relevant? Or do people really want the mainstream press to be, to be still relevant and how to break that cycle? These two studies are kind of interlinked in the sense that one is coming from the perspective of journalists and their views, and the other is how the political class is using the contemporary media that they have, both mainstream and social media. So you see this engagement that is two way, increase of mainstream media as a tool on social media platform. So that I thought was very interesting and probably should provide some feedback, some insights into understanding what is going on in contemporary media. But then there aren't just journalists and there aren't just political leaders. There's this huge crowd of people in India, our general public, that is also using social media because we are a user-generated content era. It's never been this good for people. And we must also focus on what they are doing, how they are doing, and, and does it make sense, right? So my, my just published paper that Rubel was just talking about, it just came out this month, in fact, is, uh, is uh, my examination of tweets of um, how people reacted, how middle class reacted to uh, when uh, your, your, your domestic migrant laborers who are on roads uh, during the lockdown in 2020. Um, this generated a lot of publicity at a global scale for the Modi government. 
Um, and, and we have to, um, so I decided to look at it as to what people are doing on social media. And people, people in India are actually using social media platforms to express outrage, anger against establishment, against the system. So people are doing their own thing, right? So journalists are doing their own thing, political people are doing their own thing, but general people are also doing their own thing. And they are using these platforms for reacting to situations that was probably blocked during the legacy media era, era when there was no feedback loop, you know, when people, general people were mainly consumers, but not generator of content. Uh, now we see this very active, very interesting mediated society that's so robust that everybody wants to share in the pie. So everybody wants to say something. So people are expressing their outrage. That's the, uh, so outrage was directed against the central government who was deemed responsible for the crises, but not just that, previous governments, state governments. So people were angry and they were expressing their outrage on the social media platform. And what was interesting ar around this time was that it was the social media that kind of discussed this situation, this, this crisis of migrant laborers more than the mainstream, mainstream media did. So we see this reaction from people and Twitter, which was inundated with videos and pictures of people suffering on road. And then the mainstream media, the mainstream press that we understand the big branded corporate media houses. And that's how they started following the story. So we, we, we find this interesting pattern here that it's the power here is distributed. We can always make an argument here that power is more with the ruling class, more shared with the corporate media, that's another thing. But yes, of course, people also do have a say and they have a mechanism to react. So the narrative of this crisis changed from migrants being seen as virus spreaders to migrants being seen as sufferers. So while we are discussing the role of media in society, we cannot negate people's role in creating content and how that is impacting the society. Of course, there are larger questions here about misinformation, agenda, hate campaign, doctored videos, et cetera, et cetera. But then, the, but then it, it also presents a, a platform for Indian population to do something here. What we really find very interesting is, and this is another study that's going to publish, uh, this is from the second wave of COVID-19 crisis, is the tagging behavior of fixing accountability. And so this is how this, this is what is going on here, that people have found an outlet to kind of seek answers from authorities. It happened both during the domestic crises, and it also happened during the second wave crises, uh, the devastating second wave of COVID that killed so many people, that fixing of responsibility, that tagging behavior, asking questions. So people are also doing their own thing. So what are the lessons here for people like us who are scholars, who are media educators, who are um, engaged with media literacy campaigns? I feel, and, and this is the research that I, I have conducted, I feel there is an immediate need for media literacy campaigns. People need to understand that there are real concerns around privacy. There are real concerns about doctored information, fake videos, etc. I think there is a need to bridge that gap. Uh, journalists can do that. Uh, educators can do that. We can involve people from corporate world if we want to. There needs to be a sustained effort in teaching people that you, just because you get a device in your hand, which is very cheap, it doesn't mean that everything that you're going to read is right. People also need to be informed about the agenda of different entities, including the mainstream media's agenda. And that's where the mainstream media needs to question itself and, um, and, and educate public that everybody has some, something to earn from the conversation that is going on. And uh, so that I will conclude my, my presentation here. So if you have any questions or if you need papers uh, from me, I have copies. If you have ideas for research to collaborate on some of these issues that we are doing, uh, I'm very open for that discussion as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope it was a useful investment.